take all night. I want to thank you very much for your thoughtfulness. I'm very appreciative of that award. I always keep it. remember this occasion. I, I don't know where Gilliam got all the pictures, but he's <laughs> 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 quite a production man. You know, I'm going, I'm going back a little bit on the early days of broadcasting. I didn't have the first station in Minnesota. As a matter of fact, there were three or four broadcasters ahead of me. And tomorrow morning, we're going to pass out to the meeting. Something I found on my desk a few, a, few, a few weeks ago. The dates back to 1927. And this, 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 all the states in the country when we had free broadcast, no government interference, no radio commission, no FCC or nothing. And good, good days, believe me. <laughs> And some of these names I don't quite recognize. But the example, there's Kitson, Extra, Kitson Enterprise at Halleck, Minnesota. Had a 50 watt station back in 25 or 26. Built themselves. Before me in Minneapolis was Beamish Electric. There was WLAG, which is a cutting washing radio, who went broke, they built sets and Dunwood Institute at a station. And Dr. George Young had a little five watt transmitter and then I came with high power, 50 watts that time, which I increased to 500 watts. <laughs> the, um, the operating commercial was very difficult, very difficult. I made a deal with the Marigold Ballroom to broadcast their band an hour nights, uh, six nights a week. In return for that, they furnished me a studio free of charge and put a tower for me, a pole, a 60 foot pole for my antenna. And I had $800 in cash that I saved my flying days, so I was really starting quite well. In those days, I was a pilot and I would fly carrying passengers um, weekdays and Sundays to get the money to operate, to keep the station going, meet the payroll. Many nights, all I had for dinner was coffee and donuts for a nickel. Believe me, it's, I kept my weight down. <laughs> 148 pounds. Well, anyway, went along that way until we moved to the Radisson Hotel, where they furnished a space. And uh, the first shock, my first shock, came when they organized the, the radio, Federal Radio Commission. It's, they're going to... Originally, to have a license, all we did was notify the, the Department of Commerce who would assign us a call there. We, we'd tell them what we wanted to get it and had an inspector, but didn't have to worry about a license. One time, after we moved to Radisson Hotel, Mr. Cruz furnished me the quarters. I had monk cloth on the ceiling and the walls to then the studio. A federal inspector came along and tapped his hands. The studio is studio, too live, I can't approve it. Too live. I left to deaden it. Well, the truth matters, I couldn't afford to do any more work in the studio to deaden it, so I left it like it was. About two months later, another inspector, chief inspector in Chicago arrived, checked my studio and said the studio is too, too live. And then I ran the studio out for some broadcast, for some record making and it was perfect. Anyway, uh, we had very difficult times. I won't bore you with a lot of detail, but I'll tell you a few of the interesting parts of it. When they, when the Radio Commission passed, uh, I started operating, we had a man from Minneapolis appointed a commissioner. One of the big milling companies sponsored his promotion is, is um, where the government got him on the commission. His first act in the commission was to come back to his office, and, in his own office, who was a competitor of mine, and cut my power for 1,500 watts. And then they had a law passed by the ordinance, an ordinance passed by the city council which said that no station could operate in the city limits with power over 500 watts. Well, we went to court with that and I have a few friends that backed me up and we, a few attorneys who went to bat and we stopped that. Then we had the big night, the big opening night. Big publicity had the governor and the mayor and we had an announcer going there and said, good evening ladies and gentlemen, this is the opening night of WAMD. And about that time, we went off the air. Our, tra our generator burned out, <laughs> and <clears throat> we're off for we're off for five days. 
the generator, generator, generator was fixed and installed back in the roof 14 stories high. And the electrical company who did the work came up to collect the money, which I didn't have to pay. As I recall, it was $700. So he came up with the sheriff to take my generator away, which had put me out of business completely. So Mr. Cruz, the manager of the hotel, the owner of the hotel, who was a lawyer, said, let me see those papers, Sheriff. And the Sheriff showed the papers, and said, those paper, papers are entirely legal. They can take your generator. Nothing to stop it now. The gentleman go right ahead and take the generator. By the way, don't use my elevator. <laughs> 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 and said, and, and don't scratch my stairway, because you do, I will sue you. So I turned to the electrician and said, don't I spend a lot of money you every year? And I said, yes, you do, considerable. He said, come on, Sheriff, I think we'll forget this deal. <laughs> <laughs> and the sheriff left, and so we started proceeding. Well, went on the way and the step, and we kept growing. And, and then I was looking for advertisers. In the morning, I would, I would go out selling advertising. In the afternoon, I'd program the station. And in the evening, I'd put the show on. And we used to have good music. And few men in this business is interesting to know that back around 25, 24 and 25, to put a record in the air, you had to take the horn, the record horn, and put a, hold a microphone in front of it. The microphone, by the way, was not a very good pickup that time. And the, and the result was a very noisy record which wasn't worth listening to. About 1926, the, the people in Chicago, the Panasonic phonograph, came along with a, with a new record player, which was electronic. And uh, some of us in the business, including myself, got one of their Panasonics speaker deals and then we were able to put a, put a record on first class quality. Well, it was difficult in those days, many times I had a deal to broadcast the Dayton Tea Room Mortgage, $100 a month. My competition said, we'll do it for nothing. The, uh, I had a deal to broadcast the Golden Pheasant Cafe Orchestra, $100 a month, and the competition said, we'll do it for nothing. Pretty tough competition. <laughs> <clears throat> one day, one day, three boys came to see me, they had an orchestra. They had banjo, drums, and piano. So we want, we want you to pick up our band. And I said, boys, what you want is the big station. You want WCCO, the big station. They said, we couldn't get in there. I said, yes, you can. You go over there and you tell Mr. Bellows that Mr. Hubbard wants to sign you up in the year's contract to broadcast five nights a week, once exclusive. And I'm sure Mr. Bellows will go along with you. <laughs> 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 um, that's what they did when they told Mr. Bellows that I wanted to exclude the contract for a year. Bellows said, you came to the right station, we're the high power station, and signed them up. Then a friend of mine who was an engineer at the show, and well, the pickup engineer went to make the pickup and said, where's the orchestra? Right here. Banjo, piano, and drums. <laughs> and he called Mr. Bellows and said, God, we can't pick that up. And he said, you have a contract. <laughs> <laughs> So for one year, my competition had, had the three-piece orchestra on the air. <laughs> <coughs> now in those days, I was at ball, American Ballroom and, and all they had was crystal sets. Now, in 26, that water can came out with a little one-tube set that, with an earphone instead of a crystal set that you tune, which is quite sensational today because you did away with the crystal where you had to try to get the right spot in the crystal. And then from that you could get an amplifier and, and uh, add to this at water can to get more power. About 26 is when the first radio sets came out, like the Fleischmann for one of them. And then we started to really move more sets moving. I, uh, I feel kind of bad about what I'm going to say now, but Gil Holmes has been a friend of mine for years and made his very fine presentation I would see spent some time on. But I had a chance, I had a chance in the early days back in 26 to pick up the orchestra from the armory. And the telephone company would not sell me lines. <laughs> said, you can't, said, you can't, said, you can't buy lines. And I said, why not? Because you're, they didn't say junk, they could have just as well said junk equipment because I did not have, I did not have a standard purchased Western Electric transmitter. Western Electric, Western Electric in those days sold 100 watt and a 500 watt transmitter. And I said, why can't you sell me lines? They said, if we sold you lines, we'd be conflicting with the patents of AT&T, and we could be sued very seriously because we're part of the, 
of the conspiracy to violate the patents. <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, we had to make a contract with the Bell with the AT and T for where we had to pay forty one hundred dollars for a license to to get in order to get lines and also and also all to buy West Electric microphones, which is the only mic you could get really to to do decent broadcasting and. Uh, I never yet because to give my money back. <laughs> but uh, years ago, the Ford sued RCA and AT&T and sued them on the patents. Very conflicting. Had to have a patent on hygiene modulation. A lot of, as Frank here tell you, a lot of patents involved. So uh, General Electric and AT&T were out collecting money on the patents. Then Bella, then the what the Ford sued them and won the suit in the Supreme Court, which meant that the patents they were selling were, they had no right to sell, did not belong to them. And and it kind of opened the old patent situation. And by the way, I'll tell you about my first experience in speculating. I was in the Senate, Senator Nye's office when the clerk came in and with the news directly from the Supreme Court, they just passed a decision, which meant that the Ford were worth $10 million more money and AT&T and RCA were worth $10 million less money. So I said, here's where I make a killing. So I called St. Paul, like a big shot, and I said, buy me 100 shares of DeForest and sell short 100 shares of RCA. You know what happened? RCA went up and DeForest went down. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and I haven't been in the market since. I'll stick, to my own, I'll stick to my own business. Again, I want to tell you I appreciate this being here tonight and this honor and I, Never forget it. Thank you very much. Well, I've had several embarrassing things happen the last few weeks. I've had a lot of publicity. I uh, met a wonderful girl in Miami. I love to dance with her. Wonderful dancer. <clears throat> I told her I was 51 years old. <laughs> <coughs> then the publicity came out. I'm 81. <clears throat> well, I went through a lot of trials and on news, I decided, I started the first news, regular news, and I decided I'd do a lot of investigative reporting. I thought I had, should tell you the story. One day, the one of the police officials, Minneapolis, called me, said, you little bastard, if you ever mention the police department again, you'll find yourself in the river with a, with a cement block on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> that got it down for me a little bit, so I, I had to that over. <laughs> I don't think we could conclude this meeting tonight without saying something nice about, about our outgoing president. Frank, we're all looking forward to missing you. <laughs> <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>